Good afternoon and welcome to Call of the Wildlife. There's no place like home. It's, this is part of Born to be Wild, a series of events held this fall to celebrate the Chicago River system and our amazing wildlife. I'm sure you've probably encountered some of the birds, butterflies, bees, um, even a, an occasional wild mink um, on the riverbank. Um, we're so glad that you're able to join us today. My name is Kim Olson Clark. I'm Director of Development here at Friends of the Chicago River and serving as a moderator. Um, looking at your questions in the chat box, we do ask that you just, can, if you've got a lot of questions, please type away in there. We'll get to them at the end of the Zoom meeting. Um, just some housekeeping updates. Just make sure you turn off your audio and your video. We want to make sure that um, Stephen, who's got to go out into the field, um, has enough power bandwidth and anything else that relates to technology so that you're able to see the wildlife. We are recording this um, for educational purposes and we'll share the link out later to you um, so that you can view it um, at your leisure but again and again and again. Um, before we begin, I've got a short video with a keynote message from our Friends' uh, Executive Director, Margaret Frisbee, so I'll begin that shortly. Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Margaret Frisbee, and I'm the Executive Director of Friends of the Chicago River. I'm delighted to welcome you to Call of the Wilds, the first event in our inaugural Born to be Wild celebration of the Chicago River system and its wildlife through a variety of nature and river-based experiences. Before we begin, I would like to thank our sponsors, Aon, CIBC, Levenfeld Perlstein, Molson Coors Beverage Company, Ozinga, PepsiCo, Shoreline Sightseeing, Waste Management, and the Wolf Point Properties, Wolf Point West, Wolf Point East, and Salesforce Tower Chicago. While we are here to celebrate, I would like to remind you that Born to be Wild is a call for action for clean water, healthy habitats, resiliency, and public good, and that your participation will help us protect and improve the Chicago River system. After today's program, I invite you to go to our website at chicagoriver.org to find tickets for our October 29th virtual masquerade cruise and the November 5th Rivers Imperium concert with Fifth House Ensemble, as well as links to the silent auction and scavenger hunt. It is now my pleasure to introduce Maggie Jones, Conservation Programs Manager at Friends of the Chicago River and Stephen DeFelco, Director of Sand Ridge Nature Center. Thank you so much for joining us and have fun. My name is Maggie and I am joining you today from my home to share with you the ways that Friends of the Chicago River has helped improve the homes of wildlife in our area. So before I get started in speaking about those projects, I want you to meet my friend Stephen down at the Nature Center. Hi everyone, thanks so much Maggie. So my name is Stephen DeFalco. I'm the director at Sandridge Nature Center on campus in the south suburbs of Chicago here in the Cook County Forest Preserves. And before we get started, uh, all Cook County Forest Preserve programs start with a land acknowledgement statement that I'd like to read before we get going. The Forest Preserves of Cook County acknowledges that we are on the ancestral homelands of the Council of Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi tribes, and a place of trade with many other tribes, including the Ho-Chunk, Miami, Menominee, Sauk, and Meswaki. We commit ourselves to developing deeper partnerships that advocate for the progress, dignity, and humanity of the many diverse Native Americans who still live and practice their heritage and traditions on this land today. So just some housekeeping things. If you have any questions, definitely um, put those in the chat box and Kim, our moderator, will kind of compile all of those and we'll get to all the questions at the end of the presentation. So don't worry, we didn't forget about you. And we're gonna go ahead. If Maggie, you have any last minute notes before we meet our first animal. No, please take it away, Stephen. Looking forward to it. All right, I'm going to switch my screen because although 
I'm looking good with my mask. Uh, we are here to see the animals. So this is our red-tailed hawk. So our red-tailed hawk, um, the wildlife that we have at the nature centers, we're one of six nature centers with Cook County Forest Preserves. We don't name our wildlife because we want to make sure that the public realizes that these animals are wild and they're not pets. Uh, so that's kind of why, unlike Brookfield Zoo or other places like that, we don't name them. Um, so red-tailed hawks are predator animals. They are raptors or birds of prey. And throughout this program, we're gonna be talking about homes, no place like home, and how these different animals have different homes and how we at the Forest Preserves and with the help of Friends of the Chicago River are helping the natural ecosystem so these animals have better and safer homes. So talking about our friend, the red-tailed hawk, whoop, <laughs> he's jumping around, trying to get a good shot of him while we're talking here. Uh, in terms of habitat for the red-tailed hawk, you're unlikely to see this bird in your backyard as red-tailed hawks live primarily in open habitats. So when we say that, we're talking about the deserts, shrublands, grasslands, even roadsides, fields and pastures and parks. Uh, but primarily we're looking at open woodlands, uh, also known as savannas, as their main uh, habitat where they live. In terms of their diet, they are winged soarers. So what that means is as they soar above the open area that they habitat in, they are able to identify prey with their keen eyesight and swoop up and get anything from different small mammals to snakes and other small wildlife. Here at the Nature Center, in case you're wondering, our red-tailed hawk's diet is primarily made up of mice, rats, and a small fowl called quail. So where do these birds nest? Red-tailed hawks typically put their nests in the crowns of tall trees where they have a commanding view of the landscape. They may also nest on a cliff ledge or an artificial structure like window ledges and even billboard platforms. Who builds them? It's a team effort. Both members of the couple build the nests or they simply refurbish one of the nests they've used in previous years. Nests are tall, uh, piles of dry sticks that sometimes are up to six and a half feet tall and three feet across. So most basketball players can fit in a red-tailed hawk nest fully developed. And like our homes, they go back every single year, just like we have a home that we go back to every single day. So with that, the inner cup is built really nice and has uh, dried grasses and bark and kind of like they make their own mattress inside their nest. So while we're talking about the red-tailed hawk, we're going to transition into another kind of cousin of the red-tailed hawk, the osprey. And before Maggie talks about what Friends of the Chicago River is doing for the ospreys, let's just pull some unique commonalities and differences between what you're seeing today and what they're building for in terms of homes, because there are some slight differences. In terms of habitat, he's gonna try and go, okay. In terms of habitat, ospreys prefer to be near shallow bodies of water, including rivers, lakes, uh, reservoirs, swamps, lagoons, marshes. So where the red-tailed hawk prefers more land-based in terms of their diet and their location of nesting, ospreys are a little bit more on the water side, you know, looking for that lake house, if you will. Um, for diet, ospreys are the only hawks on the continent that eat almost exclusively live fish. So some adaptations that they have to be great anglers or fishermen and fisherwomen include a reversible outer toe that allows them to grasp with two toes in front. So most talons or claws for hawks are three in front, one in back, but ospreys have that unique feature to better grab the fish um, from slipping out in the water. In terms of nesting practices, it's a little bit different than red-tailed hawks and some other hawks, where red-tailed hawks have a joint effort in the building process. Males usually go out and find a location and bring the materials, and then the females will come and kind of be the architects and the designers. So the males will go pick a spot, 
build it out, like bring all the materials and then the females actually construct the nest. So with those similarities and differences outlined between our red-tailed hawk and osprey, but generally speaking of the nesting uh, and home practices of our raptors or birds of prey here in Cook County, I'm going to turn it over to Maggie and she is going to talk about how friends of the forest, friends of the Chicago river, excuse me, and the forest preserves of Cook County are actively working together to build smarter and safer homes for our osprey population. Maggie. All right. Thank you so much, Stephen. That was super cool. Um, so like Stephen mentioned, I am going to talk to you about starter homes for our Osprey friends. And this is a project that we conducted with our partners at the Forest Preserves of Cook County. So to start off, this here is an Osprey. So you can tell it does have a different look than the red-tailed hawk that we just met. So let's talk about some of the characteristics that distinguish it from other large birds of prey species. So first off, Osprey are large birds. You can see here that they have a wingspan of five feet. So they are as long as some adults are as tall. If you've got binoculars or maybe a really nice scope when you're out and you can zoom in on their faces, Osprey are known to have these yellow eyes that you see in this photo here. And another trait of theirs is this stripe that goes over their eyes and down to their neck. That's usually like a dark brown or black color. And then their wings and their backs are gonna also be that same dark brown black color. If you see the face of an osprey and it has a darker orange eye, like you see here, that indicates to you that it is a young osprey, that it has not yet reached adulthood. And then the way to distinguish between males and females, if you're fortunate enough to see them on one of their nests, if one osprey appears bigger than the other, then the female is the bigger of the two. And then the other way that you can tell is if you look at this picture and you see this collar or necklace of dark feathers around the bird's neck, that tends to indicate that it's a female. Sometimes the males will have a very light version of this or the males tend to have an all white neck and chest. Now, as Stephen mentioned, osprey do eat a diet nearly exclusively of live fish, um, which is perfect for our area because the Chicago River system is full of many, many fish and different varieties. So their menu can be varied. Um, and as Steven talked about those modifications that they do have. So you can see here, like he talked about, they're using two toes on one side of the slippery fish and two toes on the other side. And what's really neat is when osprey hunt, they do dive into the water feet first. And so they'll grab onto the fish, but then when they fly away, they reorient it so that the face of the fish is heading forward first. Like Steven talked about, the osprey do build nests. And as you can see here, they're going to gather things um, like the sticks and the branches that you see. Um, and like Stephen mentioned with the red-tailed hawk, osprey are also looking for a spot that has a great 360 degree vantage point. These birds wanna be able to look all around them and that is so they can keep an eye out for things like predators or any threats to their nests themselves. And so these starter homes or these nesting areas are something that Friends of the Chicago River and the Forest Preserves have helped assist Osprey with. We wanna provide them with safe locations to raise their young. So we do that by building things like this. This is a platform. So these platforms are pretty big. They are three feet by three feet across. And you can see that there's some wire mesh attached to the bottom. And that's so when the birds gather their materials and add them, they don't fall through. They stay there nice and neat on top. And then these platforms are attached to very long poles. And we have a video here of the pole going up. Now, the location of where the pole was put in was uh, determined by wildlife biologists from the forest preserves. And like Stephen mentioned, osprey do like to live near water. So this particular pole was going up near the Little Calumet River down at Bobian Woods on the south side of Chicago. Um, and the pole itself is 80 feet long. 10 feet of that goes into the ground. So the platforms itself will be up above the ground by 70 feet or roughly you know, as high as a seven story building. And as you can see, the pole is away from other trees. So there won't be a way for any predators to jump from a branch onto the pole. There's a safe distance away. They can keep an eye on everything around it. These poles and platforms are very sturdy. So if a weather event would come through, they're gonna stay in place. The platform itself isn't gonna blow off as might be the case if they're nesting in a natural tree. 
So once it's installed, you get something that looks like this on a beautiful sunny day, and it is available for our Osprey to utilize. And what you hope to see over time is this. So you can see that this platform here has had some material added to it. And what's flying around it with their very characteristic M-shaped wings, that is an adult Osprey, um, monitoring the area, monitoring me as I filmed. As I mentioned, they are very protective, so they were keeping an eye on me as much as I was of them. And um, if you're fortunate enough, when you have a pair nest on one of the platforms, what you hope to see is one of these little guys. So you can see a little hatchling uh, osprey chick right here with the two adults. Um, at this particular platform, there were actually two osprey that hatched and fledged. So not only do the platforms serve as the place where the eggs hatch and where the young are fed, you can also see from this video, again, taken from a distance, it's the first place um, that these homes um, allow osprey to test out their wings and learn how to fly. So that's what you can see here is an osprey stretching out those wings, kind of trying to understand how to get some air underneath it so it can fly away at some point. And here's an image of that. Um, you can see both of the adults and the other juvenile watching this juvenile make a landing, a uh, successful landing, I might add. And what's pretty thrilling about this species, and Stephen also mentioned this for the red-tailed hawk, is that osprey will return for, to the same nesting platforms if they're successful year after year. Um, and this particular pair were successful this summer. They did fledge two chicks. And so while osprey are a migratory species, meaning that They've already headed south. Um, they took off last month. Um, we do look forward to welcoming them back to the starter home um, probably around April of next year. So with that, I would like to send our presentation back to Stephen at the Nature Center and so we can meet our next animal. Great. Thank you, Maggie. It's always awesome to see those osprey. Um, so I am a little bit warmer and a little bit drier back inside our exhibit hall here at Sandridge Nature Center to show you our other two animals for this presentation. Um, so as we talk about these animals, I like to kind of think of parenting and homes as very much a spectrum where we are very on one end we use our home for a variety of things and it's the same exact structure day in and day out. And parenting uh, for different families can be all the way into your forties. So, but with our animals here, it's a little bit different. Um, so now we are going to be looking at our next friend who is our common snapping turtle. And this is probably the shyest I have seen our common snapping turtle in a long time. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with this species, there's actually two different types of snapping turtle. There is the common snapping turtle and the alligator snapping turtle. We at the Sandridge Nature Center have a common snapping turtle. Uh, their diet, surprisingly, a lot of people think they are just carnivores, but they're actually omnivores. And in fact, plant matter accounts for about one third of a snapping turtle's diet. So in terms of talking about homes and nests, nests uh, when do they build their nests? You know, we talk about migration, we talk about a specific time period um, that spawning or mating or breeding occurs. And for snapping turtles around this area, it usually begins around April and they'll hatch their eggs in their nest that they construct. And after about three to six months, depending on the weather, um, the uh, baby turtles will hatch and go to water. So in terms of location, you know, where do they build their nests? Snapping turtles build their nests uh, like a lot of other reptiles and they kind of go to dry sandy areas and lay between 20 and 40 eggs. And there's actually been accounts that some snapping turtles have laid upwards of a hundred eggs at a time in one nest. And interestingly enough, reptile eggs are actually leathery in texture. Um, so they're not the hard shell eggs like we see in birds and like we buy uh, chicken eggs at the store. And then also the temperature uh, will determine the sex of the baby turtles. So a warmer nest will generally produce females while colder nests will generally produce males. 
so now we're asking ourselves, you know, Maggie was talking about the osprey having about two uh, fletchlings in the nest. Uh, usually hawks and osprey are anywhere between one and five. Um, so why are we seeing one to five in a raptor nest, but we're seeing upwards of 100 eggs at one time with a, a snapping turtle nest? And the main reason for that is predation and kind of the parenting that we are talking about. So where a hawk or an osprey will um, protect and kind of nurse the babies and the eggs, uh, snapping turtles and other turtle species, uh, as well as reptiles in general, usually are not the best in terms of being good parents. They essentially lay the eggs in the nest and to use a recipe phrase, it's a set it and forget it mentality for uh, creating baby turtles. So once they're in the nest, the mother never goes back to the nest and never really interacts with the babies once they hatch. Um, because of that, the nest is very vulnerable to predation. And that's why there's the high volume of eggs being laid. Um, interesting note as well about their eggs, uh, as opposed to a chicken egg that we're familiar with that's kind of oval and has many different colors. Snapping turtle eggs are actually white and round, almost resembling more of a ping pong ball than the oval shape that we're accustomed to with chicken eggs. So it is important to note as we get into Maggie's part of the turtle presentation that snapping turtle nesting traits are generally the same for all turtles. So when we talk about conditions needed to build a successful home for snapping turtles, uh, it can be applied to the majority of turtles living in our area. And Maggie will talk about some of those species. Um, there are a few exceptions like our musk turtles, um, but for the most part, they really do need that sandy, uh, loose soil to really dig in and lay a successful nest. So as Maggie pulls up her portion, I'll try and get a nice little close up here. Um, and Maggie will be talking about how we're creating that soil content uh, that's most conducive to a successful turtle nest. Take it away, Maggie. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you for introducing us to that common snapping turtle. So like Stephen said, I'm going to be telling you um, about how Friends has been working with the forest preserves on creating a better first home for turtles. So most of our turtles in our area are aquatic species and they spend most of their lives in our local waterways. Um, and that's where they find their food. That's where they're going to hide from potential predators. They're going to burrow into the mud over the winter season along the waterways. But technically, a turtle's first home is really on the land. And like Stephen mentioned, um, like the snapping turtle that we just met, those females are going to come up and out of the water and onto the land. And that's because they want to find a spot that's well above any area that might flood during the time that the eggs are underground. And the reason that she's doing that is those eggs need to stay dry. If they would become wet, they wouldn't survive. And so she is going to go on a journey out of the water to find a place that her eggs will be safe. Unfortunately, in our area, a lot of the time what she's gonna run into is something that looks like this. So an area that's filled with something called invasive species. Um, in this picture, you're seeing something called European buckthorn. So they're very thick, woody species. It creates an environment that looks like this that really isn't even inviting for you and me, let alone a reptile species looking to lay eggs. You can see that sunlight has difficulty making it to the ground and the ground is somewhat bare. And when the sunlight doesn't reach the ground, what's gonna happen is you're gonna get some really hard compact soils. So turtles are gonna have a difficult time traveling through this area and they would also have a difficult time digging into the earth there. So unfortunately, female turtles tend to run into an area where there just isn't any vacancy. And what happens is they go somewhere alternative in a place that looks like this. So here's another female turtle. She's come out of the water and she's looking for a place to dig a hole to lay her eggs. And where she decides to dig is right here on this recreational trail, which makes for a great picture here. We can see it happening. However, it's not ideal and it's not a safe place because there's gonna be a lot of traffic, right? A lot of foot traffic from people enjoying the outdoors on this trail, maybe dogs on leashes, people on bicycles. So it's not an ideal spot whatsoever. And even if the eggs 
did do okay underground and the hatchlings would come out, they're then going to be vulnerable to predators again because they're going to be exposed and out in the open. So what we need to do is provide more land and more space for these female turtles to have to lay their eggs. And I do want to show you some of the known predators. Um, these are species that do really well in our area and don't need any assistance. And these are the ones that narrow in on these limited nesting sites that female turtles have and are known to eat the eggs. So we want to, again, provide ample opportunity and space for these females to have their nests to guarantee future generations of turtles in our lifetime. So what we need to do is clear out those invasives. So we work with the forest preserves and we hire professional ecological restorationists who come out and remove those woody invasives over the winter months when the wildlife are less active, when turtles are certainly not active. So they're gonna come out, clear those woody species so that we can go from a very dark, crowded out, non-inviting area that looks like this into something that looks like this, very sunny and lush with native plants returning. Those are some grasses and some sedges on the ground. And again, turtle is looking for something that you and I might look for. We'd much rather walk through something green and lush like this than kind of the dark spooky forest. So friends has worked with the forest preserves to do this land clearing on over 150 acres in the forest preserves. And meanwhile, some wildlife professionals have been doing research to determine if turtles are in fact using this new area. So what you can see here are those wildlife professionals um, doing a, sort of a basic medical exam on the female turtles and then also attaching radio telemetry trackers to their shells. And by doing this, what that allows us is to understand the locations of turtles over time. So where these female turtles were retrieved, they're returned directly back to the same space and we're able to monitor their whereabouts over a 12 month period to understand where they go. And what the research showed was that in fact, they very much do use the new land that's there for them. So on the left here, outlined in red is an area that had been cleared by those contractors. So we've allowed uh, the woodies to disappear and we're bringing in those nice soft um, grasses and flowering plants. And then over here on the right, you can see during a 12 month period in that same area that had been cleared, the turtles did travel over that area. So the very next season was a great response from them. And this type of research over three different locations has shown that the nesting success rate has increased by 60%. So that's an awesome jump and something that we're really happy with. We're glad that the turtle populations have been cooperating with this project. And as Stephen mentioned, this project doesn't just benefit the common snapping turtle. So I did wanna show you other species that you might encounter in our area. So this is a snapper up here. This is a red-eared slider, painted turtle. This is a musk turtle, Eastern spiny softshell map turtle, and if you're really lucky, you might even see a Blandings turtle out there. So again, we wanna um, turn our land from something that looks like this, that's full of invasives, into something that looks like this, that has some native plants returning, because technically a turtle's first home is on the land. And with that, I would like to turn it back to Stephen at the Nature Center to meet our next animal friend. Yeah, thank you so much. So when we are talking about our last animal, you've seen enough of me for the, the day. We're just going right into the animal and I will do my best to track it. This is going to be our hardest uh, camera operating to capture this lively pumpkin seed fish. So the appearance of the pumpkin seed, uh, pumpkin seed is a part of the Lepomis genus, which is uh, also in the same kind of grouping as warmouths and various sunfish and bluegill. Uh, anglers may classify this fish in terms of a panfish and also include perch and crappie into that categorization. Um, but in terms of appearance, the main difference, and if he stays like this, I can get close enough. Yeah, hi. So once he turns, uh, you'll notice the black spot on the pumpkin seed that's very indicative, but you'll see very slightly a red kind of crescent moon border to that black spot. And that's going to be the main difference between bluegill, sunfish, 
um, and the pumpkin seed. The pumpkin seed is the only one that's going to have that red crescent shape around that um, that flap over its gills. Um, also a noticeable feature that it has is that coloration, the lining and the splotching of the blues and the oranges uh, near its cheek and its belly. So you can kind of, as it moves, see that little hint of orange on its belly as it goes up and down. Uh, so in, with that, kind of knowing how to identify it, uh, the habitat for the pumpkin seed are shallow, uh, protected freshwater tributaries such as lakes and rivers, uh, really an area with lots of vegetation and sandy, muddy, or gravel bottoms. Uh, and they usually stay close to the shoreline. And they also prefer shallower waters because they really don't go that deep. Um, the deepest they usually go would be about 10 feet. So in terms of open water versus more of a pond, lake, stream, uh, they're really more conducive to that kind of freshwater, slower moving water. Their diet, uh, they're also omnivores. They eat a sl small variety of organisms, including snails, worms, insects, mollusks, uh, even some small fish. Um, but then they also do eat uh, some of the vegetation that is part of their habitat. Like the snapping turtle, temperature matters when it comes to fish and fish health. Uh, so once water temperatures warm up to about 68 degrees Fahrenheit, that's kind of their seasonal cue uh, to kind of migrate, like birds migrate during certain types of the season. When temperature levels uh, in the water rise and lower, that's kind of the uh, seasonal indicator for fish to either migrate to their spawning areas or to head back out into more open water. So with that 68 degrees kind of warmer water, it'll trigger the males to head to shallow water and begin building their nest. So similar, uh, kind of going along that spectrum again, you know, snappers, set it and forget it. Uh, we have our raptors, birds of prey that are a little bit more parental, use their nest a lot more. Um, the type of nest that pumpkin seeds make, uh, they're known as pit diggers. So males will build nests in shallow areas by making a round hole in the sand or gravel. And then they'll, uh, they'll often build nests close to one another, creating colonies. So when we're doing kind of regional environmental education, I always like to say, you know, you know, finding Nemo and the coral reefs get all the glory in terms of communal living, but our own fish here in the Chicagoland region um, do a very similar style of colonizing. Um, males definitely do have their own territories, but in general, um, you'll see a lot of males nesting in our terms in a general area on the waterway. So the number of eggs, you know, we're, we're getting higher and higher number of eggs as we're going from species to species. Uh, one to five with the birds, upwards of 100 for the turtle, but averaging around 20 to 30. Uh, pumpkin seed fish and other fish in this sunfish family uh, lay hundreds of eggs. And a lot of this kind of goes to that same predatory nature of the turtle. So that's going to be one of the reasons, you know, strength in numbers. If you lose a couple along the way, uh, you're still kind of getting the species forward in that sense. Um, so that's kind of the number of eggs. In terms of protecting, so we have a lot of protection with the birds of prey. We have no protection parentally from the snapping turtle and other turtles like it. The fish kind of sit in the middle in terms of parenting styles. So the males are kind of the stay-at-home dads, if you will. Once the females lay the eggs in the uh, pit digger nest, the males will go in, fertilize the eggs, and then they kind of keep the house up. So they will actually use their tails to fan away any particulates or debris that would then smother the eggs. And then they also fan the eggs to provide ample oxygen, 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 oxygen uh, to the eggs. So once they're doing that, the eggs hatch. The fathers then kind of go out into the tall grasses in the water 
And that's kind of their nursery. So, you know, the coral reef and finding Nemo, um, the nursery that you probably buy your plants at for home. Um, fish have their own little schools and nurseries in these shallow tall grass areas for added protection. And the males actually stay with them for that period of time, furthering protecting the fries um, or a small fish. So FRI is another name for a small fish like the pumpkin seed. Uh, in terms of timeline though, this all happens in the span of a week or two. So uh, pumpkin seeds usually live to about six to eight years old. So of that six to eight years old, you're getting some very strong uh, dad parenting for the first couple of weeks. And then once you leave that nursery, uh, you're kind of on your own. So that is a general synopsis of the nature of how these pumpkin seeds build their nests, where they build their nests, how many eggs and kind of who does the parenting. So I'm going to turn it over to Maggie one last time and she is going to be going to be talking about an amazing project that is, you know, finding new homes for fish, but then also kind of improving on the homes they already have. Take it away, Maggie. All right, thanks, Stephen. And thanks so much for introducing us to that pumpkin seed fish. Uh, it's kind of a rare opportunity to be able to see them like that, so thank you. All right, so yes, uh, I would love to share the story of how fish found a new home. Um, this project took place down in Southwest Cook County in the Palos region. And I do wanna give a big thank you to our partners in this project, Forest Preserves of Cook County, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources and the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, so what you see before you here is Mill Creek. And again, down in the Palos region of Cook County. And Mill Creek is flowing towards you in this shot. Mill Creek is a natural waterway. It's just over two miles, 2.2 miles long. And what you see going over Mill Creek here is what's called the Cal Sag Trail. It's a really great recreational trail in that area. So this bridge allows you to cross over the creek. Now I want you to come with me here and let's pretend that we are standing up on this bridge. If you stand on the bridge and you continue to watch Mill Creek flow out, what it runs into is what's called the Cal Sag Channel. And the Calseg Channel is a human-made waterway. It was a part of the reversal of the Chicago River system, and it is about 100 years old. This was dug back in 1922. Um, and what it effectively did was prevent any fish from coming into the creek. So if you look at this photo here, you can see some of these barriers. So this is limestone that's lining the creek right here where it meets the Calseg. So if you're a fish and you're swimming along the Cal Sag coming from either direction and you want to head into the creek, if you're a really tiny fish, you're probably not even going to make it over this barrier here. If you're a little bit bigger, maybe you do make it farther in. However, when you reach this barrier here, this concrete beneath the bridge, you're definitely not going to make it in. So that's what's been happening for just about 100 years, was that the fish would try to make it in, would effectively be denied. And would be forced to have to go back out into the channel. So they were missing a really great opportunity to establish some homes and carry out some of those life cycles that um, Stephen described to us. So if you're a fish, you're gonna give Friends of the Chicago River a call and you're gonna ask for these barriers to be removed. And so that's what this project is. Um, but first we wanted to work with our uh, partners on this project and figure out who was already living in Mill Creek. So in order to do that, they conducted a fish survey. So here we have scientists from both DNR and the Forest Preserves of Cook County, and they surveyed the creek, and here's what they found. Seven different species of fish. Um, and this included some smaller fish like creek chubs and white suckers. There's also goldfish, but also largemouth bass. We've got green sunfish and bluegill and central stone rollers. So a nice um, little population of fish that were already hanging out in Mill Creek. But we knew that we wanted to bring in the abundant amount of fish species that we know exist in the CalSag to have the same opportunities in the creek as the fish that were already there. So we had to take those barriers out. And in order to do that, got to bring in the big machinery. So what you see here um, is this construction equipment breaking up those limestone barriers that were preventing the fish from coming in. So this project took a few days of these large machines breaking up the material. 
So they did it both in the area closer to the cal sad, and then they also took out about a 12 inch section of concrete underneath that bridge to really remove that big barrier. And you can see these chunks of material coming out. What was cool about the design to get fish to come in was that we were able to reuse these materials. And I'll show you the result. So you can see here after the construction was complete that it's a much smoother, if you will, um, swimming journey to get into the creek itself. So we're looking at Mill Creek flowing towards us. Now we're gonna jump back up on top of the bridge and we're gonna look how the creek meets the channel today. And what you can see here is that what was created was sort of a series of steps for the fish to reach the creek. And where the water is darker is where the water is deeper. So if you're a fish now and you're swimming along the Calsag channel, you're gonna turn into the creek and you're gonna have a nice little spot to rest here. You can travel a little more, rest, travel, rest, and so on. And now you can even make it under the bridge into the creek. We welcome any and all fish species. This design was made to be inclusive from the smaller fish to the bigger fish, biggest fish in the area. So in order to find out um, if anybody did make it into the creek after the construction, we went back out with those fisheries biologists and surveyed the creek again. And what I wanna point out in this slide, uh, this is Steve Sillick from the Forest Preserves helping conduct the survey. The creek really has some of the natural elements that Stephen said that the fish are looking for, um, for their reproductive processes. So we've got the, you know, the muddy and not so um, rocky bottom of the creek here. And we also have some vegetation coming in. So as Stephen mentioned, some of the requirements that these fish species are looking for that would be lacking in the human made channel, the calcite channel that the fish are coming in from. So those survey results, we did find the original seven again that I mentioned before. And we were thrilled to discover that just two months after the creek had been opened up that five additional species had joined. So that included the common carp, it also included the blunt, blunt nose minnow, channel catfish, spotfin shiner, and then also our friend that we just were introduced to, the pumpkin seed fish. So here's a nice video of the Mill Creek flowing towards the Calsag channel. Um, and that is the story of how fish found a new home down in Southwest Cook County in Mill Creek. So with that, I know Stephen and I are looking forward to answering some of your questions. Um, I'm gonna send it back over to Kim, who's been keeping an eye on the chat, I believe, and she will let us know what you're interested in learning more about. Kim? Yeah, thank you, everybody. You've got some really great questions here. And then also, um, I've got some of my own questions to ask. Um, we're gonna start out with, I've got kind of, uh, Picking backing a little bit back on the osprey. So this is a question that either Maggie or Stephen can answer, which is, this is from Jackie. She said, would an osprey dive bomb a person if they feel threatened? I know I've been attacked by blue jays occasionally and robins, um, but what about an osprey? Maggie, you were out there filming, you felt that they were kind of watching you, but would they dive bomb you? Somewhat. Um, I would use the term swoop down at you. I don't really feel like they ever came close enough that I felt threatened, but they definitely made their presence known. You're also more likely to hear them as well as see them. They do let out a bit of a shriek, uh, a repeated shriek to let you know that they're, they're sounding the alarm of an intruder or someone too close to their nest. Uh, but yeah, they definitely do swoop towards you uh, to let you know to keep your distance. Okay, and then mm. this one maybe for Stephen a little bit. So the that cute pumpkin seed fish, um, he, she, they. What? <laughs> how do you tell a sex? Yeah. So fish and a lot of even some of the uh, reptiles and amphibians we have here, the sex identifying is definitely a process, and there honestly are times that especially with some of our frogs and toads and fish, it's really hard to uh, see from, we use it a lot in birding, but uh, identifying in the hand is the phrase, you know, when you have it up close in the hand, um, how do you identify it? Uh, my knowledge on fish identification is a little lacking. Um, 
so that would be something that I would defer to our fisheries department on. Um, but I do know it's something that's more intrusive than a simple looking at it in the water or in the hand even. Uh, sometimes it's a, it's a little bit more meticulous of an identification for some of those animals. So I've got a couple, I've got uh, three more questions. Uh, two of them are kind of um, in the same area. So we're gonna go back to the turtle. Um, does the moder moder monitoring device on the turtle shell make them more vulnerable to predators? Great question. Any, Maggie or Steven? I'll jump in Steven. Um, so no, I, I've had a very similar question when we were out with those wildlife biologists. They really don't. They don't impact their speed or their mobility. Um, those antennas do bend, um, so it's not like they're going to get caught up in anything. And just based upon the survival of the ones that they are tracking, they seem to do just fine um, with them attached to the shell. Uh, the glue that attaches them doesn't last forever, so at a certain point they do drop off. And they can tell if a turtle doesn't seem to move for a while and it's in one spot, sometimes that just means the tracker has fallen off. Um, but to answer your question, no, they seem to do okay with them on. Okay. And so um, from, from Jackie, um, is the Mill Creek Bridge new, like basically created for the CalSAG bike trail? Any history on, on the bridge there? That bridge is quite old. Um, and I can tell you that from a project management standpoint, when we were looking for the old blueprint plans of it, they were not, uh, we ended up not discovering them. So I think it was an original a railroad and that was converted to a recreational trail. So that bridge itself, um, decades and decades old. Okay, so then this one's for Maggie, but um, uh, Stephen and or any, there's, a, there's also staff um, also, uh, friend staff out here too, maybe to answer this next question too. Um, Maggie, what other river systems does the Cal Sag channel connect? I am, and this is from Wendy. She goes, I'm, I'm specifically wondering if there are consequences for the Chicago River Little Cal uh, River sewer system outfalls, thus possibly making the work on the Mill Creek axis even more helpful to species like pumpkin seed fish possibly expose, exposed to pollution. So anybody want to chime on that one? And if Maggie, I see John Coyle on this one, and I also see M Margaret on, also on there. So if you want to pipe in on that question, to help I'll, with Andy. Give, okay. I'll give either of them a chance. Um, but if not, I'm happy to jump in too. OK. okay. Um, so yeah, there are other tributaries, other systems that do contribute to the Cal SAG. Um, and yes, those sort of instances of, let me see here, let me read your question. Um, the sewer system outfalls, yeah, that type of thing does affect the water quality. Um, so, I mean, this type of work is advantageous anywhere in any part of a system, even if the water was 100% clean at any location, it just has more to do with the barriers to it. And um, this wasn't a dam removal project per se, but very similar to ones that you're seeing Another part of our system, um, like the River Park Dam was removed and we've seen a great ecological boost from that. Um, so these types of projects are important um, in various areas of water quality because uh, wildlife does persist to varying degree um, depending on what's going on and this can just help improve it. Um, projects like this, you know, we talk about how it's specifically for fish, but the fish are gonna bring in um, organisms like mussels Baby mussels attach themselves to fish gills, so mussels are going to be brought in to Mill Creek, and we're actually monitoring that as well with the MWRD. And mussels are um, living water filters, so we, you know, hope that this will even continue to help improve the water quality of Mill Creek itself. Um, so I hope that generally answered your question. If you want any more clarification, please feel free to reach out. And this is from the fifth grade class. Is there a public resource to be able to watch? any animal that are tagged, such as turtles or other species. So when the turtles were tagged, were, you know, was there anything that were public access to do it or was it something um, that was only done by the Illinois Department of Natural Resources? And as we continue to tag, and Stephen too, knowing about some of the tagged animals, is there a way that the public can watch that and watch some of the animal, animal movements? 
Yeah, so I'll take a first crack at this. So I think um, from our wildlife biologist standpoint, some of these projects um, simply don't have the bandwidth to um, have real time publication of the data. Um, a lot of times uh, we use telemetry units, which is kind of like a radio signal um, to locate the species and what we're tracking. Um, but I do know kind of going to the, the nesting idea for our raptors uh, throughout the nation, there are a lot of different wildlife organizations that do do uh, nest cameras. So you can see the nest in action. Uh, I know a couple years ago, there was a really popular bald eagle nesting camera that everyone was watching uh, in our offices. So um, whether it's uh, specifically to this area, um, I do know there's a lot of great organizations nationally um, that make their data either public after the fact or um, in the terms of the Nest camera can track in real time. Anything else to add, Maggie? Yeah, I'll just add, um, like Stephen mentioned, sometimes they'll share that information after the fact. So in real time for species like turtles um, can be somewhat of a concern. We don't want anybody to go out and find the turtles and take them themselves. So it's uh, also a level of protection for them. Um, there are also great websites. I know the Urban Wildlife Institute has pictures from their wildlife cameras that you can see. So you can get an idea of what's out there after the dark in various places in our area. Okay, and then Margaret pointed out the Cornell Ornithology um, website has great nest cameras as well as part of it. Um, the fifth grade class at North Park, and again, thank you guys for attending. I uh, wish I can hear the big cheer that you guys are all sending right now for being in class. Um, uh, the fifth grade class is wondering what other kinds of animals can be found near the Chicago River, or are there other resources to learn more about local species? Um, Maggie and Stephen? So um, we've got a few minutes and I'll see who's really easy to spot. So our poor little, uh, a lot of times how we acquire animals is they're injured um, and not able to be released into the wild. He doesn't really move a lot because he's only got three legs, but this is our little musk turtle. So this is an example of one of the species that we mentioned in the turtle habitat. Um, so that's just kind of one, uh, <laughs> one different animal that is readily accessible here um, right next to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you're reptiles, amphibians, so we have a lot of, uh, a lot of toads, frogs, uh, turtles, um, the raptors, but also I think one one piece of the wildlife in terms of river ecology that Maggie hinted on is really the um, insects and macroinvertebrates. Uh, the, the insects that you may hear but never really see um, that make up the diversity and the ability for the ecosystem to thrive. Um, I feel like dragonflies, butterflies, all of those types of insects and macroinvertebrates are the kind of unsung heroes of the water ecology. And those animals deserve just as much credit for the healthy ecosystem as some of the animals that we've seen today. Maggie, do you want to Yeah, I'll agree with that. Um, I know one of the classrooms mentioned that they've been studying food systems, food chains and the like. So as Stephen pointed out, those macro and micro invertebrates are really the base of it all. And everything kind of kicks off from there. And um, there's a lot of great things to discover. That's why the fish was really cool because you don't get to see those up close. Um, crayfish are in our water system. We've got mink, uh, muskrats, great blue herons, all sorts of really cool things out there. Uh, there's also a section on Friends website, chicagoriver.org that lists all the different wildlife species. So feel free to check that out too. Okay, we've got a few more minutes. I would like to at least uh, to talk a little bit to Maggie individually, then Stephen, and then I'll close out here. But Maggie, maybe you can update us about some of the projects underway, including maybe some of our wildlife monitoring projects that we do. Yeah, sure. Um, so we do have wildlife monitoring opportunities. Um, we hope to have some additional trainings happen next year in 2021. So keep an eye on our website 
Um, we do have opportunities to monitor bats as well as turtles and osprey. Um, Wendy that's here today is a monitor. So thank you so much, Wendy, for joining us. Um, like I say, stay tuned for that. Um, as far as our projects go, we do have some additional turtle habitat work that we're gonna be doing this winter to add to our total numbers of acres to help all those species. We do work with the uh, Forest Preserves of Cook County on some other uh, large scale land restoration projects. And it's very similar to the turtle habitat work where we're gonna go in, remove invasives and allow the sunlight back to the ground so that those natives can return. Um, and what's great about turtle habitat um, projects is that it's also going to help the entire ecosystem. Uh, when you bring back those native plants, you get the insects to come back. The insects are going to attract native birds. So you get that food chain going, that ecosystem going. When you have native species come back and growing, that's going to help with stormwater infiltration. So those native plant roots are going to help hold that water in place so that it's not running into our creeks, streams, and rivers like it would otherwise. So it's actually going to help improve our water quality over time. So a lot of these projects, they might have a, a singular focus on paper, um, but they truly do benefit all people, plants, and animals, which is the mission of Friends. And then Stephen, turning it over to you, can you tell me about making a visit to Sand Ridge? Uh, Nature yeah, Center? definitely. And before I talk about Sand Ridge, just a quick shout out. Uh, Centennial Volunteer Program that we do with Friends of the Chicago River is an amazing restoration-based volunteer program that has sites throughout Cook County, definitely take advantage of those um, in addition to the monitoring. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to this year, but I'm usually a site captain for Chicago River Day, which is another great collaborative event that we put on. And, uh, you know, taking some of the, the human uh, aspects of the river system out of the equation by picking up litter in the waterways. Um, in terms of Sandridge Nature Center, we're right on the border of South Holland and Calumet City, right off of I-94, on a, off of 159th Street. We are actually open seven days a week. Uh, we opened our grounds and restrooms uh, right after 4th of July, um, and we only close on Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's. So over 360 days, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., we are available. We are doing registration-based public programming. Um, as well as Facebook Live programming and uh, virtual visits for school groups or any other type of organization that's interested. Uh, so definitely my contact information will be available um, and definitely get in contact if you want a program virtually or if you want to come to the Nature Center. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Maggie. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I would like to also just highlight the Friends of Chicago River, Chicago River Schools Network. Um, some of the teachers already know our ecology manager slash he knows about everything that is possible about the river, with the exception of maybe uh, John Coyle and Margaret Frisbee, um, and all about the animals and even the rocks, because he's a geology major. Um, that's Mark Hauser. And so um, we also do classroom visits and um, field trips to get kids into the water, actually looking for macro invertebrates and stuff. So please feel to reach out, look at our website, go to the, um, you know, get involved and look up uh, Chicago River Schools Network too. Um, thank you all so, so very much um, for joining us today uh, for this presentation. And I hope you've learned a little bit more about the incredible wildlife that live um, in and near uh, the Chicago River system. Um, it's 156 miles long. So it's a it's a nice medium size fun river. It's an incredible asset to the Chicago land area and also to everything that's around here. Um, we want to make sure it remains uh, the water quality gets improved so that um, you know it's always going to be better for people, plants, and animals. So I hope you get to join us for some of the other Born to Be Wild events that we've got coming um, uh, this week. Uh, we also have a scavenger hunt. Um, if you go on our website, there's some fun things that you can do to possibly win some prizes. So um, it's, a, it's been designed for both children and for adults. So um, go out and enjoy. And if you can't find it, uh, please reach out to me and we'll, we'll make sure you get the links. So anyway, have a great afternoon. Um, got any other further questions, feel free to email us. Um, thank you again. We'll see you soon on the river. Thank you. Thank you. Say thank you. Bye. <laughs>